Funding for Louisiana Legends is brought to you by Roy O. Martin, known for its honesty, excellence, stewardship, and respect for the land. A devotion to these values has allowed Roy O. Martin to celebrate 90 years building a better Louisiana. And... Louisiana Healthcare Connections, dedicated to delivering quality health care throughout Louisiana. Get healthy and stay healthy for you, your family, your health. Additional funding is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Dad is about as open and a transparent and honest person as you'll ever meet. He always was a champion for doing the right thing. For Murphy J. Foster Jr., better known as Mike, doing the right thing is the driving force and basic philosophy of his life. This former Eagle Scout and successful businessman decided to get into politics because he wanted to make a difference. Mike Foster's love for Louisiana and love for people drove him to work tirelessly for our state. He was born in Shreveport, Louisiana, but grew up in the small community of Centerville in St. Mary Parish. He attended public school in nearby Franklin, enrolled in the Virginia Military Institute, and then transferred to Louisiana State University. Mike worked summers as a roughneck on Gulf oil rigs as he pursued a degree in chemistry. Dad went through Air Force ROTC at LSU and ended up having to go to Korea during the Korean War. He learned to fly in the Air Force, uh, a great passion of his even until today. When the war was over, Mike Foster, no stranger to hard work and long hours, returned to St. Mary Parish to work as a sugarcane farmer. Dad sharecropped about 550 acres when I was young. And I remember very long hours especially around grinding and planting time. Later, that grew into a contracting business because he was looking for a way to keep his people busy during the slow seasons of farming. But Mike ended up with a, having about 500 employees at his company, and he collected the largest group of cranes that could be found between New Orleans and Houston, so it was quite big. Mike Foster took little interest in politics, but when his state senator would not return his phone calls, Foster launched his first campaign for public office. In 1987, at age 57, Foster, a Democrat at the time, unseated the incumbent state senator. Mike went into politics not to become a politician, but to accomplish the goal that he had uh, set for himself, and that was to save the workers' compensation market in Louisiana. Dad, being a businessman, was interested in tort reform, getting insurance rates down, and becoming a more business-friendly environment. Foster served two terms as state senator and then decided to run for governor. And I said, why in the world would you want to do that? And he said, well, I love Louisiana and I think I can do some good. And so I want to, I want to run. He knew he could do it. He thought it was important. He thought he could make a difference. Foster qualified for the race as a Republican. I think he became every man's candidate because he had so many interests in life. He was a huntsman, he was a fisherman. One of the most uh, effective ca uh, campaign television presentations was with, with Mike Welding and flipping up the, uh, the mask. Many, many people doubted that that was for real, but it was. He could fix his own tractors. On January 8, 1996, Mike Foster became the 53rd governor of Louisiana, taking the oath of office on the steps of the old state capitol, just as his grandfather, Murphy J. Foster, had done 100 years before. It was just so thrilling and I was so proud. My father's goals as governor had to do with bringing and restoring integrity to the state of Louisiana and to state government. On January 10, 2000, 
Mike Foster became the state's first two-term Republican governor. As the state's first businessman in modern times to hold the office, Foster's administration remained focused on sound financial management and investments in education. He cared about the people more than he cared about himself. He worked really hard. He was kind. He was effective. Six of the eight years he was in office, public school teachers got raises. He put $1.7 billion into higher ed over the, over the eight years. Louisiana went from about 46 to six almost immediately, and then finally when he left office, he was second in the nation Let's not in, lose in providing adequate funding for education. When he went out of office, he had a 60-plus percent approval rating. After 16 years of devoting his life to public service, Mike Foster returned to Oak Lawn Manor near Franklin. He loves Louisiana. He did so much for the state as senator and as governor. He made a difference in Louisiana. He added significantly, in my opinion, to the good history of Louisiana. Hello, I'm Beth Courtney, and this is Louisiana Legends. You've just seen a short biography of Governor Mike Foster, and we've traveled to Oak Lawn Manor, uh, the lovely home of Governor Foster and his wife, Alice, and we thank you so much, Governor, for your hospitality. Thank you for coming. Well, this is an amazing house. A lot of history is surrounding us, all kinds of interesting artifacts and portraits in this room. Um, and I guess when I was thinking about our interview, I was thinking about that very, very cold day when you were inaugurated <laughs> at the old state capitol, 1996, and I think it was freezing cold. It's the first time we decided, you decided to do it at the old state capitol. And there was so much made of the fact that your grandfather had been governor of the state of Louisiana. And so it was such a historical occasion, sort of connecting different generations. And I don't think I've really ever asked you much about your grandfather. He was quite a character, wasn't he? Sort of a, a really Dun Damon Runyon-esque character. <laughs> well, uh, interestingly enough, not a real influence on my life because he was the only grandparent I didn't know. He, he had left the scene, you know, 10, 12 years before I was born. So I never really got to know him and got influenced. I knew his wife quite well, who was the matriarch of the family. And I knew quite well and sit in the chair and nobody else spoke till she spoke. But uh, he, he, was, he lived in a different, different era. The speeches, I've seen speeches that he wrote that are books long. I mean, it must have taken, I don't know who listened, but they looked like to me they were two and three hours long. And well, that's not like you. No, no, no. I was known for straight five. Straight to the point. I was known straight to the point in five minutes, correct. But he traveled to South America. No, my, it was my father. Your father traveled. My father ran a pipeline station in South America. Oh, wow. And uh, he got out of LSU. I don't know whether he graduated. Went to Smackover, Arkansas, then went to the banana fields of Honduras, worked in the, in the jungle. And uh, they went from there in pipeline in Colombia. And uh, right in the middle of putting all of his letters together, because that's what well, email in those days, were letters to his mother and back and forth to Louisiana. Uh, we found a bunch of pictures, the, the mm. tigers and the alligators and the jungles and the, the, the six shooters they carried to protect themselves. He lived in a boxcar and uh, talked about he'd been just made a uh, superintendent, was making something like $20 a month, you know. Wow. So he, he lived a very adventurous life. And, and my grandfather, I think, was in a time where they wore suits and ties and were very formal. And everything I've ever seen he's, was, was formal and not informal. Well, well your father was, uh, I guess, an anti-long, I would say, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the truth is, and I shouldn't even say this, but I remember, <laughs> I remember when he and my mother were talking down there, and I was young, and he turned to her and he says, Olive, we can move back to Louisiana. Huey Long's gone. Wow. And that's why they moved back. I mean, it was, the feelings were that strong in those days. You were either long or anti-long. So he came back here and got into a sugar operation and worked there. Well, we're surrounded by sugar cane fields here in your current home, right. and uh, it's omnipresent, you know? Yeah, I, was, I was thinking about it, your sugar cane, oil and gas, hunting and fishing, those are sort of the holy trinity of Louisiana, if you will, South Louisiana, and you're involved in all of those things, are you? Not? Yeah, I guess so, because I, I grew up down here, and uh, I do love to hunt and fish, and I do love boats, and uh, 
I had a construction company working three or four hundred people, and we worked in, in the oil and gas industry, part, partly that, partly other things. And uh, yeah, so you, you can't live down here and not be part of it too easily. People uh, accused you when you were governor of not traveling enough, <laughs> but you certainly traveled as a young man. You were in the Air Force. You went to Korea, right? Whether I wanted to or not. Whether I went you to wanted Korea. to or not. <laughs> <laughs> we all did know those days. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Well, I, I think I told you my story. I asked my troopers one time if I traveled as much as other governors, and they said, yeah, it's for work you did. But I was chair of Southern Governors for a year. In fact, I think I'm the only governor that's ever been chair of a governor's association until Jindal, who chaired Republican governors. And, and that was interesting. I learned a lot just being exposed to those governors from other states. In fact, I, I was out of state in 9-11, and they took our airplane away, and we had to I get a car and drive that. back. I yeah. remember that. That was a very terrifying time. Ooh. So let's get into your politics a little bit. I, the reputation is that you really don't like politics too much. <laughs> well, is, is it true that you decided you were going to run for the Senate because your senator wouldn't return your phone calls? Right. Is that true? <laughs> you're, you're correct. Politics was a means to an end. I was 57 years old running a business, and I, my senator wouldn't return my phone calls, and I was got interested in some subject matter that he wouldn't talk to me about, ran against him. And to be honest with you, when I go back through some of the issues that I was interested in, we changed them. We, we did a lot of things that were different. But no, the politics itself, I, you know, I enjoy being around people and I enjoy doing things, but uh, the politics was never an attraction. It was just accomplishing something. Right. So you're, ve you're very driven. You're very direct in what you're doing. And, and I, I was going to ask you about an issue. You're known for having done uh, workers' comp legislation, changing, uh, doing tort reform, and all kinds of business and industry things. But I recall there was an issue that you had in your campaign that you didn't succeed on, and that was you thought we should have referendums in Louisiana. Uh, you still think that? Well... I think it's the ultimate uh, in, in democracy. I tried very hard. I lost that by one or two votes, just like I lost the gambling vote by one or two votes. Right. But, uh, and, and speaking of gambling, we weren't able to stop it, which I, would, I tried to do, but we're the only state in the union that's got the option for parishes to opt in and out. So that's, we, that, that was significant. But referendum, I just uh, I always liked it. Uh, it, it bypass the political process. It allowed people to go out and do things. And, but I didn't, no, I didn't quite make that. I lost that by one or two votes. You lost that one by a little bit. But of course, I always thought that you had a real sense of being a CEO, a chief, uh, the, the chief of the state of Louisiana, but you knew how to delegate. Did this come from your business background, you think? It really does. It really yeah. does. You, you can't run a business uh, and micromanage it. People that do get into all kinds of trouble. You, you pick good people, you leave them alone, and you change them if they can't do the job. But uh, I bet if you'd go back to people that ran my departments and ask them how many times I called them to do something for me or for somebody, uh, you wouldn't see two or three phone calls. Rarely, rarely, rarely did that happen. In fact, uh, I'll do it today, but when I was governor, I would never write a recommendation. If somebody asked me, mm -hmm. would you write a recommendation for my son to go here or there? I just can't do that. That's not fair. If I'm CEO, I can't write a letter for somebody. And like I say, I can do it now that I'm out, but I wouldn't do it then. Well, I recall, so you were governor of our great state of Louisiana for two terms. Right. But right after your term was up, I'm looking at... Um, 2005, we had these hurricanes. And I thought to Katrina, Rita, really devastating for Louisiana. And I recalled everybody just being, just thinking, oh, if we had Governor Foster to tell us what to do, when to do it, how to do it, because it's, it, it took sort of the general in command. Did you feel frustrated that you were kind of on the sidelines? To a degree, because I was mm -hmm. used to being in the other place, and right. we did we did sort of centralize and get a place to run things out of when we redid the state police barracks area, and uh, yeah, but but we had hurricanes, we had hurricanes, yes. and the, the, the thing that I had that probably worried me the most, the Mississippi River almost got away from us. I remember that, and we very 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 close, and if it had the hurricanes and the floods would have looked like a Sunday school picnic. It would have flooded half the state if the levees would have broke. And, and by that time, we were beginning to have terrorists. And we, uh, 
we had meetings every day and every night and every evening to plan what we were going to do the next day. In fact, my favorite story from that is uh, the guy that was running the Angola, uh, the warden, Kane, called me one night at three in the morning and said, we got to abandon Angola. He said, we can't keep it together. I said, please try one more time, Warden, would you? And he did, and we saved it. It would have cost the state a billion dollars to, to move them, to rebuild Angola. Later, Angola's later, later, that bend in the yeah. river there and their levees. And, well, yeah. that levee had never been taken into the system, and the next year I got the National Guard to go up there and rebuild that levee up to standards, and that's why we haven't had a problem since. Wow. That must have been uh, fraught with concern. So that's one of the memorable things. Yeah. When you're looking back on those eight years, what, what are some of the other things that are memorable for you? Some of the big things that I enjoy thinking about, uh, I remember talking to Mark Drennan and I said, Mark, I have always hated the fact that we rent buildings from people in this state as a racket to get paid back for political stuff. I said, let's build some buildings and make the state some money. And, 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 and he, he jumped on it, and we did it, and downtown Baton Rouge is different. Once it really has dramatically changed, isn't oh, yeah. it? And that all happened during your time. Right, and it was our idea. And then once those buildings are paid for, it's going to make a lot of income for the state because those buildings were built to last a long time. Well, I remember, yes, blowing up the old buildings and building <laughs> the wonderful yeah. new ones that were there. But I guess one of the other la lasting legacies that people point to for you is your investment in education. You understood that higher education was important. Well, you know, during the campaign, I got into it. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I hated college. I despised going. They gave me a big award here recently, the higher education community, the first they've ever given to anybody. And I went over and accepted it. And I said, you're lucky, because I said, if ever there was a governor that did not like college, it was me. But, you were in chemical, chemistry. Yeah, chemistry. Chemical engineering, really. And then, then got a chance to go into the Air Force, went in the Air Force. But... Uh, during the campaign, I began to see some of the things that were going on. One was that the, the colleges were falling down. Mm. We had to rebuild them, and we did it. And so it just sort of came as a natural thing, but uh, it wasn't anything I planned. It just, and then the other thing that, that got to me was, on, in Southern Governors going around, <laughs> the community college system, all the states had them. We didn't. Mm -hmm. We really didn't have one, and that's where young people can go for two years and then make a good living. Right. The other thing I did was, education-wise, when I first got in, I said, we're remediating all of our students. Let's up the entrance exams in, in LSU and other places. Oh, well, politically, you can't do that. I said, well, we're gonna do it. And we did, nobody ever complained. Well, I think certainly uh, a lot of conversation about education right now, and a lot of people are comparing uh, what Governor Jindal is doing currently to the investments that you made, and of course, you either get the credit or the blame <laughs> for bringing Bobby Jindal into government. Tell right. us how that happened. Uh, he was a very young man, and you really gave him a chance. Well, that's an interesting story, and it's a discussion of politics. The Constitution had been changed right before I got elected. We had something like 30 days to pick a cabinet. It wasn't to put together a team to pick people, you know, because you don't think about that when you're running, you, you mm -hmm. try to win. And the area that I was most afraid of, and I thought there was the most corruption in, was in health and hospitals. Mm -hmm. I was definitely afraid they would bring me some person to look at that was a super resume and all that, but would be part of the problem. And I was determined not to have that happen. And John Bro and several in the Congress sent him down to visit, and he came down to my construction office. We sat there and talked. I says, you want to do what? He says, I'd love to work in health and hospitals. I said, really? And we talked a bit, and then I asked him what he was, I, I, I said, look, I can't pay you too much what you're making. Mm -hmm. I said, what are you making? He said, I'd rather not tell you. Well, he was making way more than I could pay him. But I said, if you want the job, I said, I, I think I'll give you a try. But I was afraid that I would get, I knew, knew he was, I knew he had intelligence and the ability to do things. The private sector was paying him a lot of money. And the political sector up there had recommended him too. So, and, and he did a good job there. I really can't, he straightened that department out and it, it was in trouble. I mean, there were bad stuff happening. As you're here, um, there's a very small exclusive club of former governors. Do you all ever confer with one another? Do you talk to Buddy Romer or Kathleen or any of them? Or we, We've much? had a few meetings, but n not really business meetings. Yes, uh, Kathleen got us together one time and uh, 
So no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> You're on your own. But I will tell you, I, I know that our viewers probably are fascinated by this, and I always have been about you. You learn new things rapidly, and you love to do that. You, you fly a helicopter, yeah. you went to law school <laughs> while you were governor, and then after you were governor, are you learning something new now? What are you studying these days? Well, I, uh, because I don't have a secretary anymore, I've had to learn some stuff. I'm pretty good at computers today. Wow. <laughs> I mean, because I have to be. Oh. I mean, if, if I don't know how to deal with a computer, I'm not going to be able to communicate. In fact, my wife was trying to make up her mind when she started in the computers, and I said, you don't even want to be able to communicate with your grandkids? She said, yeah. I said, so you don't want to be able to send pictures? Yeah. I said, well, then learn. And she has. But no, I've, I've done that. Uh, I'm still active in, in some business issues. I'm, I'm chairing the board of LWCC, and that has been a success. That is the biggest expense business has in this state, and it costs less than it did 20 years ago. And the rates are going to drop this year. That's and great. that's the biggest expense that any business has. And uh, that was something that, that I decided to do that I didn't think I could do and was able to do. You know, a lot of people remember that during uh, your campaign, you had spots where you were a welder. You <laughs> pulled up your welding. You can, you really do know how to weld, right? Because you have to. I was, I was a cane <laughs> farmer. I was a, when I, when I got out of the service, I, I had five employees and I was the chief welder, the chief mechanic, the chief bookkeeper, the chief tool setter. So I had to learn. I mean, th th yeah, that's for true. I did it because I had to do it. Well, so learning new things is just part of your makeup. Yeah. Are you a, are you a curious person? I guess so. I guess mm -hmm. so. I really, uh, I am when I get into things. I like to learn as thoroughly as I can. But You don't like to give speeches too much, though. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I really don't. I, I just get to the point and, you know, and uh, have what I have to say, and that's that. If you have wishes for Louisiana for the future, um, what would those be? What, what, what do you hope that your, your grandchildren, you, you, you look out, um, somebody who maybe would, your grandchild would want to be governor, what would you say that you hope Louisiana is going to be in the future? Well, for sure, a place where you can get a job, where you can get a decent education. And like I say, the community college system didn't exist. And I was talking to a board member that I'd put on it the other day, and he says, you know, this year we're going to, something like 30,000 students are going to graduate, and that's from almost zero a few years back. And most of those youngsters that go to a community college can go out and make a decent living, not a, not a hand-to-mouth existence, you know. So, you know, a place where you can get jobs, a place that, uh, uh, you know, government is run properly, and, and you know, I don't, a lot. There's not many people, let's put it this way, think about this. Not many people in government have gone to jail in the last two years. People love to talk about in state government. That's right. <laughs> in state government, but uh, people love to talk about the corruption in Louisiana, and, and I don't think any of our people had any problems and gotten legal problems. I don't think I've heard of any in the administration this last four years. Well, I think the one thing that I think about when we look forward to our future, a lot of people are concerned that maybe our coast is eroding and that we're going to lose just by the very nature of a, you know, for a variety of reasons. You know? and, and we did a lot in that area. But, you know, I told people that really you couldn't deal with it until three things existed. You, have to, you had to have satellites to see down and see what was happening. You had to have GPS to give you elevations. And uh, you had to have computers to figure what was happening, to calculate it. And so up to that point, it was very difficult for people to really see enough of the coast or, or calculate what was happening. So those three things, once they started to exist, made it possible. And it's not as bad as it seems in some respects in Louisiana. We're actually building Delta. South of here, south of here, we're building Delta, a big Delta, uh, from the Chafalaya River. It's coming out the Wax Lake Cut, it's coming out the Chafalaya River, and it's shallow down here. And if old river structure would break, that's where the river would come. It would come right down here. And uh, 
So we're building Delta here, and of course we're losing it in other areas, in Grand Isle area. And I, I think it's happened over the years. I don't know. Of course, what changed it was when we levied the levies in, and, mm -hmm. and we had to do it. Uh, but that stopped the sediment, and it's, it's very difficult, money-wise, to fix that. But you can still dump sediment down here and build Delta. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if we're building close to as much as we're losing. No, nobody says that much. And we've got to try not to lose what we're losing, but it's very difficult. Because the Mississippi River dumps into deep water. In order to build a delta, it's got to dump in shallow water. Back before the levees, it did that. Well, Governor, it is, you seem very comfortable with yourself in this beautiful <laughs> location, and I can't wait to look around some more uh, of your lovely home and uh, so many fond memories of your time as governor. And we thank you for taking the time to speak with us and the LPB crew here. And congratulations on being a Louisiana legend. Thank you. I, en I enjoyed that. Well, thank you for joining us for this edition of Louisiana Legends. Good evening. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. Funding for Louisiana Legends is brought to you by Roy O. Martin, known for its honesty, excellence, stewardship, and respect for the land. A devotion to these values has allowed Roy O. Martin to celebrate 90 years building a better Louisiana. And... Louisiana Healthcare Connections, dedicated to delivering quality health care throughout Louisiana. Get healthy and stay healthy for you, your family, your health. Additional funding is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. <laughs>